to try and help people understand what was going on. But you can't take those two literalistically because of what would end up happening. So John Flavel and others, they use language between the three persons in heaven, but that can't be taken in a sense where there was a conversation and the, the son decides to submit to the father. The pactum salutis is a way for us to understand why certain persons do certain works. And it comes back to the point about why the son became mediator. It's not a way for us to posit the distinct wills in the father, son, and the spirit, but rather, how do we explain the ad extra work of salvation based upon the triunity of God? And we give salvation an eternal basis based upon who God is, but God in his being as one God did not need to think about how to save or have a discussion on how to save. God made the decision to save in a certain way that would bring most glory to who he is, but the Son was as concurring in that as the Spirit and the Father. There was no need for an agreement. So sometimes when the language of agreement is used with regards to covenant, it gives people the wrong idea in eternity that the, the Father and the Son and the Spirit had a sort of like discussion among them. The agreement can be understood in an orthodox way insofar as the agreement is just the unity of purpose and will that is necessarily present among the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So there was never a idea that the Father came up with salvation and then the Son had to say, okay, I like that. Whatever the Father conceived, the Son equally conceived and the Spirit equally conceived. And how it happened, there was no negotiation, but only a perfection of unity and will in the purpose of salvation. In conclusion, um, when examining whether we may describe the eternal relationship between the Father and the Son in terms of authority, the Father having authority and the Son submitting, certain questions need to be asked that relate to matters of Christian orthodoxy. Asking a very basic question proves to unearth a host of complex theological truths that have been carefully laid out over the course of ecclesiastical history. Here's the question. How can the Son eternally submit to the Father if the simplicity of God is true? Which means, therefore, that God has one essence and one will which is identical with his essence. That's the fundamental question. This is at the core of the matter, and it is hardly surprising that those advocating for the eternal submission of the Son have had to posit a three-willed trinity to explain how the Son can eternally submit to the Father, since submission necessarily involves more than one will. For those not wanting to go down this track, how is it possible, according to God's necessary will, for this to happen? These questions and many more, some of which I've raised in this paper, need to be asked when a new teaching emerges in the church. This is the task of the theologian who is not only committed to exegesis of the scriptures, but also to being part of the wider interpretative community that has worked hard for roughly 2,000 years. To what degree of humility do we have, but also thankfulness for the gifts that Christ has given to the church for 2,000 years? And to what degree are we prepared to just jettison it, in fact, in, in what we think is a clear biblical teaching? That is a very dangerous approach to theology. Today, certain people are making jumps to arrive at a tenuous conclusion about the relationship between the Father and the Son, but they have not made clear how they are getting there without bringing back into necessary personal relations another will. Is the Son's submission as axiomatic to our understanding of the Trinity as the Son's begottenness or the Father as the fountain of the deity, Fons Divinitatis. Begottenness does not require a form of subordination, nor does it require another will. But it seems to me submission requires one or both of those. 
but that is heterodox at least. And if you feel the church has generally arrived at the correct conclusions, you have no choice but to say that is heterodox. To say, however, that one can merely posit a three-willed God is not only to bring a new teaching into the church, it is to disregard the work of the church. And it is to say that if there are three wills, does omnipotence, does unchangeability, does eternity, does every attribute belong to that will, in which case you necessarily end up with three gods. And that is what is a form of tritheism. If the Son submits to the Father in eternity, you have a form of Arianism. So you have a sort of combination of tritheistic Arianism. And that, it seems to me, leads to the Son having one will in time where he suffers on our behalf, but he does so only with a divine will, which raises questions about the suitability of our salvation in his name and whether it was a true obedience to the law. And so when you move from a Trinitarian error, you move to a doctrine of God error, to a Christological error, to a salvation error, and so on. And that's the point of Reformed Orthodoxy is to stop at the initial problem so that you can consistently maintain all of the other views in an Orthodox manner. <laughs>